A gifted public speaker was asked, what was the hardest speech to give you ever, ever had to give? And he said, oh, that's easy. I was given this topic at a conference of undertakers. The topic was this, how to be sad at a funeral when you've been paid $20,000. You know, there are many sad people in life. There are times we all go through discouragement. It's hard to just get along. There are many people who seem to have no joy, no zeal. Life is a struggle. And we all face those times in our lives. But God wants us to know true joy. He wants us to know true joy. He wants us to know a joy that does not depend upon our circumstances. A joy that just radiates from our lives because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Commentator William Barclay has said, A joyous life is not a Christian life. For joy is one constant in the recipe for Christian living. Now again, all of us have struggles. We have times of sadness and difficulty. But we can all have that sense of true joy, that inner joy, because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. As Jesus prepared the disciples, he wanted to give them comfort. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to lay before them, yes, the reality that he was leaving and things were going to change. But he also wanted to remind his followers that there would be rewards to come. Even in the midst of trying circumstances in our lives. Jesus is telling the disciples... And he's telling us today that we always have a reason for joy if we're followers of Christ. We always have a reason for true joy, that inner joy in the life of the Christian. And so we see in John 16, verses 16 to 33, the Christian should experience joy. The Christian should experience joy joy paramount as our first point is this the christian should experience joy because there is joy in the resurrection there is joy in the resurrection verse 16 jesus seems to give the disciples a little riddle he says a little while and you will no longer see me and again a little while and you will see me. What in the world is he talking about? The disciples are, are continually struggling to figure out what is Jesus saying to us at this time. He goes on in verses 17 and 18. Some of his disciples then said to one another, What is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, What is this that he says? A little while. We don't know what he's talking about. They're really trying here, but they're continually confused. And so Jesus tries to give them a hint. He shares in verses 20 to 20, 20 through 22 he says truly truly i say to you that you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice you will grieve but your grief will be turned into joy he continues in verse 21 he says whenever a woman is in labor she has pain because her hour has come but when she gives birth to the child she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. 
Now we understand being able to look back what he's talking about here. Once again, Jesus is speaking of in this short time, he's going to die on the cross. They're going to suffer incredible grief. They're not going to fully understand. But then he's going to rise again. And they're going to experience incredible joy. It's like a woman who has a child. Wow, a lot of pain. A lot of anticipation, a lot of struggle, difficulty, tears, frustration, all that goes along with the physical birth of having a baby. But then in a moment, in an instant, new life, an incredible joy. And there's so much joy that in most cases, Lord willing, the woman is willing to have another baby. Right? Though there was incredible pain and suffering, there's this amazing, overwhelming joy. There was great sorrow after the death of Jesus. Luke writes in Luke 23, 46-48, where the Scripture says, And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into Thy hands I commit My Spirit. Having said this, He breathed His last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. They were in incredible agony and mourning and sorrow, overwhelmed with grief. In many ways, they didn't know how to handle their pain. The one whom they loved and they followed had been unjustly put to death. What incredible sorrow. But then they experienced the other side. Incredible joy upon the resurrection of Jesus. Verses 50-53 to in Luke 24 says this, And He led them out as far as Bethany, and He lifted up His hands and blessed them while He was blessing them. He parted from them and he was carried up into the heaven. And, after, and they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Jesus had risen. He ascended. He gave them his spirit. They experienced incredible joy. They now had meaning and purpose in their lives. This is not the response of one who had lost a friend at death. This is the response of one who had gained life and hope filled with joy because Jesus had risen from the dead. It's said that Winston Churchill asked for two trumpeters to be placed on each side of the balcony at his funeral. One would play taps to signal his departure from this life. But the other would play reveille. For he was awoken anew when he was received into heaven and found in the presence of God through Jesus Christ. What is Christ's death and resurrection to you? Does it have purpose and meaning? Do you look at Christ's death and the cross as, a, as an incredible time of agony for this man who didn't deserve it? Is this a time where you're, you're puzzled and, and, and grieving and you don't see purpose in it? Or does His death and resurrection 
bring you incredible assurance and peace and joy in your life. Knowing now because of what Christ went through, because of His pain and suffering, to pay for your sins and His resurrection, conquering sin and death, now you can go through life no matter what you face with that sense of joy and purpose and meaning because of what He's done for you. And now no matter what you face, even if you have to face death and we all do in one way or another you can still have that true joy because you have the assurance of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ even in the face of death the Christian should experience joy because of the resurrection of Jesus And then secondly, we see in the passage that the Christian should experience joy, for there is joy in prayer. There is joy in prayer. Jesus says to His disciples, in that day you will not question Me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in My name, He will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in My name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full so that your joy may be made full concerning verses 23 and 24 evangelical scholar leon morris writes a new state of affairs is about to be inaugurated up until now the disciples have asked jesus for things directly or they have asked the father directly they have not asked the father for anything in the name of the son Jesus exhorts them to ask or to keep on asking. Then they will receive. And so we learn from this passage and from others that we are to ask in Jesus' name. To pray in Jesus' name. And also that we receive in the name of Jesus. All we do now in our relationship with God is through our Mediator our advocate, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Andrew Murray, in his classic work with Christ in the School of Prayer, he says this, to pray in Christ's name is therefore to be identified with Christ as to our righteousness and to be identified with Christ in our desires for the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And so really what we're saying here, and what this verse is saying to us is, is the secret to prayer is to be identified with Christ. We don't come on our own. We don't come because of our goodness or because we are worthy for God to answer our prayers. We come in Jesus' name, under His authority, because of what He did for us on the cross through the empty tomb. We've been saying throughout our study in John 14 to 17 that Jesus is emphasizing the importance of our relationship with God through him, through Jesus. Once he leaves, we will now be able to boldly approach the Father in prayer because Jesus stands between us. He is our advocate. He is our mediator. And we come to God in the righteousness of Jesus. We don't come to God because we are worthy, because we've done enough, because we're good people. That's not how we come to God. The only way we can come to God with a sense of assurance and boldness, but humbly, is because we come in the name of Jesus. Because He covers us. Because we are His children. Once Jesus leaves, we can know the will of the Father as we study the Word of God and as we go to Him in prayer. And He tells us as we walk according to the will of God, led by the Holy Spirit, studying the Word of God, we will know how to pray. 
And we will be able to ask the Father and we will receive. All of this, Jesus says in this passage, is so that we will know joy. We will know joy. Did you know that's part of God's plan and purpose for your life? He wants us to be filled with His joy. It's one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy. In that list in Galatians 5. Again, Morris writes, And the purpose of all this is their joy. God is interested in the well-being and the happiness of His people. They will go through trials, but when their trust is in Him, He puts a joy into their hearts that can never be removed. Notice Murray says that this is, or Morris says that this is connected with prayer. They are to pray in order that their joy may be made complete. It cannot be made complete any other way. In any relationship we have, if we're going to have the best outcome in that relationship, our communication with one another has to be open. It has to be honest. We have to speak with integrity and truth with one another. I mean, if you as, as children have to be careful what you say around dad because he may explode, right? Right? That's not nearly as much fun. You, you, you walk in timidity. You can't really be yourself. Or if you've had an argument with your spouse, you feel animosity and anger towards your spouse. Your relationship isn't what God wants it to be. Maybe you're not on speaking terms with someone in your family. You don't have good communication. And so you're not going to experience the joy of those relationships that God would want. It's the same way in our communication with God. We have to be open and honest with Him. If we are unwilling to fully and completely express our hearts to God, to tell Him our concerns, our struggles, our sins, and to get into His Word and listen to what He has to say to us. To go to Him in prayer. If we're not willing to do that, we're certainly not going to experience the fullness of His joy. And I believe that there are many Christians today who are not knowing the fullness of of that relationship with God because they're not taking the time. They're not talking with Him openly and honestly. They may go to church. They may go through a perfunctory prayer life. But they're not taking the time and making the effort to open up their heart to God and say, God, here's where I'm at. How about you? How about you? See, our relationship with God is not just something we say, okay, I check off, I had my quiet time today, and now I can get on with my life. It's a heart relationship. It's opening up to Him. It's being honest with Him. It's seeking Him with a whole heart, saying, God, what do you have for my life? I need your direction. I don't know which way to turn right now. It's crying out to Him. It's depending upon Him. He loves us. He wants to, to help us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to give us direction. And He wants us to know His joy. Jesus says that we will be able to talk with the Father personally because of our relationship with Jesus. Commentator Dr. George Beasley Murray writes, 
While we may contrast this statement with assertions of the mediatorial role of Jesus in heaven, it is clear that the emphasis in this passage is on the freedom of access which the disciples will have to the Father. There will be no need for Jesus to persuade the Father to listen to their prayers, still less to turn aside His wrath from them. For the Father Himself loves them. He loves them. He loves you. And He wants you to know His love and His peace and His joy. Jesus wants us to have an intimate relationship with God. For many people, especially years ago, this was a very foreign thing. God was holy. He was other. He was removed. People years ago didn't talk about having a a personal relationship with God. But because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, He is our loving Heavenly Father. We can meet with Him and cry out to Him and express our hearts to Him. Now, we always should do that with reverence. Always a sense of remembering He is is God. He is holy. He is awesome and powerful. And yet, He loves us. And He wants to, to cradle us in His arms. He wants us to know his peace and his joy. Andrew Murray writes in his work, The True Vine, as fruit is the greatest proof of a true relationship to Christ, so prayer is proof of our relationship to the Father. So we have to ask, how's my relationship with my Heavenly Father? How's my relationship with God? God's waiting. He's waiting for us. He wants to enjoy that fellowship with us. Like an earthly father who's who's seeking to follow God would want to go and play ball with their kids. Or go out and ride bikes or go out and play soccer or sit and talk. And our Heavenly Father loves us more perfectly than any earthly father could love us. He loves each of us so much and He wants us to know His joy. But we won't experience that unless we're spending time with Him time in prayer not just the now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayers but heartfelt prayer expressing our deepest love and needs to our father in heaven in the name of Jesus because of what Jesus did for us the Christian should experience joy for there is joy in his resurrection and there's joy in prayer Third, the Christian should experience joy, for there is joy in our Savior. In our Savior. Verses 25 to 27, Jesus has spoken much about His relationship with God and how God loves His disciples and wants to have a relationship with them. In verses 28 to 30, He continues to tell them that that He has come from the Father, and He's going back to the Father. And the disciples think they're they're getting it. Now you're speaking plainly to us, Jesus. We believe you came from God. And Jesus, as He often does, turns the tables on them. Right? When they think they're, they're starting to understand. He says in verses 31 and 32, Do you now believe? Do you now believe? After all this, you say you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, 
each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. You see, though they were trying to understand, and to a certain degree they did, they would all end up deserting Jesus. All of them. We often point out Peter's denial of Jesus during Jesus' trial. Three times Peter said, I I don't know the man, even cursed in saying it. But we we have to remember that all the disciples fled. They all left him. In fear and cowardice, they turned their back on the one in whom they said they believed. Mark records in Mark 14, 50, that after Jesus' betrayal and arrest, and they all left him and fled. We have to ask the question, how many times have we betrayed Jesus? How many times have we betrayed him? How many times have we not spoken up at the office or failed to walk with Christ on the golf course or watch something on television for which Jesus would be ashamed? How many times have I? See, we're all sinners, aren't we? We're all sinners. And yet we continue to be reminded throughout the Scriptures that Jesus knew we were sinners. He knew the disciples would betray Him. And yet He still died for them. He knew that we would betray Him. We were all sinners. We would at times turn our backs and act as if we don't even know Him. And yet He still died on the cross for us, for me. Knowing that all of us, including the disciples, would betray Him, He gave His life on the cross to pay for our sins. Oh, let that sink in. Let it sink into your heart how much He loves you and how much He wants to work in your life. David wrote in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 14, He has not dealt with our sins according, uh, dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. We didn't get what we deserved, did we? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He Himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. He knows we're going to blow it. And yet He loves us so much. He is so gracious with us. And so let me encourage you this morning, don't run from the one who loves you so much. Even when you sin, don't run from Him. Run to Him. Go back to that cross. Allow Him once again to cleanse you, to minister to you, that you might know His joy and His love and His peace. And rejoice! Rejoice! Oh, thank you, Jesus. My salvation does not depend upon me. It depends upon what you did for me, even in my sinfulness. And because of that, I want to obey you. I want to follow you all the more. The Christian should experience joy, for there is joy in His resurrection. There is joy in prayer. There is joy in our Savior. And then finally, the Christian should experience joy as an overcomer. 
as an overcomer. All Jesus has said in John 14 to 16 has been said to bring hope and joy and peace to his disciples. He is preparing them for his leaving. Remember what he said in John 14, 1. He said this, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Then he went on to say in verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Now he closes this section again with words of peace to his disciples. In John 16, 33, he emphasizes this again when he says, these things I have spoken to you. He's talking about this whole section beginning in John 14. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage. Let's just pause there for a minute. Take courage, church. We have tribulation today, don't we? We are facing things today in our culture we've never faced before. But Jesus knew that. He knew that. And He says, in the world, you have tribulation. He's not surprised by what's going on in our culture today. But He says, take courage courage why because we're strong because we'll develop a strategy because we can outvote the enemy no he says take courage because i have overcome the world you see we always have hope we always have joy we always have peace not because of our circumstances. Because we are overcomers in Jesus Christ. The disciples would experience tribulation, loneliness, heartache. But they could take heart. Jesus is telling them here He's coming back. First at His resurrection. And then through the person of the Holy Spirit. And as they abide in Him through His Word and through prayer, all the church can have confidence and courage and joy and peace because we too have the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And because Jesus has conquered sin and death and we know that He is coming again. That just as He ascended, He will descend once again and we then will have the full victory. You know, it's interesting to note here that the word overcome is used only here in John's Gospel. It's the only place he uses it in John 16, 33. But after the death and resurrection of Jesus... John often uses this word in his writings. He uses the word six times in that little letter in 1 John. And he uses the word 17 times in the book of Revelation. Because we are overcomers in Jesus Christ. We need not Worry that the world is going to win. That Satan is going to win. We know whatever we face in this life, whatever we have to go through in our lives as individuals, as families, as the church, we win because of Jesus Christ. We are overcomers. And so we look to the future and we live today not in disappointment, not in discouragement, not in worry. We live as overcomers in Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, 57 when he says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we look to the future with hope with encouragement 
with courage. No matter what we face, we experience joy in our lives as an overcomer in Jesus Christ. It was the famed preacher Charles Spurgeon who said, the 11th commandment is that we should love one another. And then he said, and for some, the 12th commandment is you shall put on a long face on Sunday. (laughs) You see, God wants us to know His joy. True joy. No matter what our circumstances. And we learn in the passage today that the Christian can always experience joy no matter what we face in this life no matter what the future holds for us in this world, we can always experience joy in the resurrection, in prayer, in our Savior, and as an overcomer. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you know our hearts today as we come. All of us could make a list of concerns of things we've been praying about, of things in our culture we're concerned about. You know what kinds of weeks we've had, what kind of month, what kind of year we're having. And for some of us, we're in a rut. We're struggling. We feel sometimes overwhelmed. We feel sometimes that we have no hope. But Lord, we come today in faith. Believing that Jesus Christ died for each of us. And then He rose on the third day conquering sin and death. And we declare this day, however we feel, whatever our circumstances in life right now, whatever our concerns, we declare this day that we believe in You And we believe we have the victory in Jesus Christ. And therefore, Lord, we ask that you once again fill us with your spirit, with your joy and love and peace. And that you would enable us by your power to trust you. We love you, Lord. Use us. Use even these hard times in our lives to show forth your faithfulness. Fill us with that inner true joy that comes only from you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you in Jesus' name.